cycle that we repeat every single month where we educate, engage, and empower people to take hands-on climate action, not only individually, but also in their community. So we're doing the first step right now by educating you all um, at the Ideas Hive as we bring in an expert to talk about a topic that aligns with one of the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we host a conversation to equip us with the knowledge that we need in order to face this issue and come up with a local solution to that global problem. This looks a little bit different now taking an online platform, but we know that it's so important to continue this conversation and continue to take climate action in our community. When we were doing it in person, we would have think slash do tanks right there at the hive where we would come up with solutions um, right there at the tables, but we're doing it a little bit differently now, but it's still so important to continue doing this. Um, so we take the ideas that we come up with at the Hive and we implement them through action projects. We're able to do this with an amazing team of volunteers and organizers as we bring these ideas to life by raising awareness and finding funding. And then every month we also put boots on the ground action to combat climate change by mobilizing volunteers for climate action projects. And this can take so many different forms. Every single month, we focus on a different topic of sustainability. So we have energy, water, food, waste, and ecology. And this is to make sure that we don't overlook any areas with sustainability because as the climate crisis is a very diverse and unique situation, we have to take in a diverse and integrative approach. Um, and so we have so many different projects that we do, shoreline projects, tree plantings, waste audits, urban agriculture, and education and solar workshops. And we do this because we don't only just wanna talk about the climate crisis, we also want to give people the opportunity to take action because understanding the crisis at hand can be overwhelming, but we want to empower people to know that this isn't a lost cause. Coming together as a community is how we can solve it. And that's why we're doing this work, because we believe that this information and this education should be free and readily available to communities. Um, but we don't just want to stop there. We also want to implement real solutions to the climate crisis that are long term and we're engaging the community in doing it themselves. So if you like what you see, please consider donating to support this mission. Every dollar you donate goes to supporting um, climate action projects and eco enterprises that pay a livable wage for green jobs. Um, and if you want, you can browse our website and find a specific project or initiative that you want to support directly. Or you can donate your time and join one of our eco committees. Um, if any of these align with your top uh, topics align with your interests or your skills, you can help us out by joining our team. Um, we also have a great internship program um, starting up in the spring again, so please look into that on our website. And we want to continue this conversation all month long, um, and you can hear about sustainable innovation, green frontier, and green businesses through our podcast at anchor.fm. Um, but today we are so honored and excited to have Charlie Rolski here with us today. He's the Director of Science at Plastic Oceans International. He has a master's and PhD in biology from Arizona State University. Um, his research focuses on plastic pollution and he's reached over 2 billion people worldwide spreading this message. Um, he's researched plastic pollution in a diverse ecosystems, but also he's studying how it affects humans. And that's how you get people's attention is how it impacts us as people. Um, and so Charlie's active in the community doing scientific outreach and empowering people of all ages to make a difference. And we're so excited and thankful to have you here today, Charlie. Um, I'll go ahead and give it over to you. So thank you so much for being here. Great, thanks for having me. You guys are doing incredible work and uh, it's an honor to be speaking with you today. So I will just bring up my slides here. All right, well, thank you for joining. This is really exciting. I like to title my talks welcome to studying the ocean in arizona normally it gets like kind of a laugh but it's hard to tell through zoom so i'll just pretend that i'm funny and we can move on um so uh, i i mostly focus on studying marine ecosystems but i still really enjoy arizona i do a lot of uh, hiking and looking for snakes uh out out here in the top right there we're, we're noodling for mud turtles so there's actually turtles that live in arizona that come out when it rains quite a bit and then bottom right there, I am removing the innards of frozen mice for these guys. I like to work at a, a bird of prey rehab center on the side and uh, they have some really incredible animals called Wild at Heart, one of my favorite places in the world. 
So yeah, I do. I do like to work in the community. I like to work with groups that are, you know, in line with the messages right that I believe in. The top left are some of the most badass people I've ever worked with. Those are the Arizona Girl Scouts, and they were working on getting legislation to to find people for releasing balloons in the environment because that's a big issue. We see them all over the planet, and uh, they're incredible. And then I uh, went to the state capitol to talk about the ocean. Was told to take it seriously, so I dressed up as a shark. And then uh, bottom left there, I was doing some cool hands-on activities with a kids group out at the Environmental Education Center in Chandler. And then bottom right, we also did a, a TEDx talk about plastic pollution. It was really uh, an amazing experience, and I almost threw up, but we got through it, so that's good. So I like to start off with a little background and just to kind of get everyone's minds buzzing. How much of the ocean do you think we've explored? Uh, I'll give you a second. About 5%. Oh, my God, I just realized that's my shirt. Look at that. Oh, that's amazing. I didn't even know that. That was totally unplanned. Awesome. 5%. So when people uh, kind of compare the ocean to space, that's exactly why. How deep is the ocean? Again, I'll give you a second to think about that. The ocean is deeper than Mount Everest is tall, which is incredible. And we're also finding plastics at the depths of the ocean. So very relevant, very interesting. But this is why it's so hard to study. It's huge. And the other thing that people are, I skipped ahead. What kind of threats do the oceans face? Well, all sorts, right? We've got trash in the ocean. We've got overfishing. There's contaminants. There's chemicals. There's whaling, algal blooms. There's there's a plethora of threats, and, and this kind of makes it you know a very difficult part of the world to study for that reason. Most of the time, if you stick your head under the water, there's nothing, right? So when I when I put my head under the water, I expect to see these immaculate coral reefs and all sorts of really cool animals. But the reality is, it's just so big that mo when you put your head under the water, it's just water empty water so sometimes there's there's interesting things and that can happen because of these really dynamic ecosystems so you have these geothermal vents that feed these small organisms that, that get, are food for larger organisms and fish and then it it blossoms into this incredible ecosystem full of all this really amazing biodiversity and, and so it's a it's a pretty incredible place to work and and study so usually i like to sort of go into my work by showing you my lab there he is right there. Uh, this is so not, this is how I got my introduction into really caring about the ocean. That's Tucker. He is a scat detection dog who is a rescue that was trained to work with the killer whales. Um, basically, these three pods of killer whales, they live off the coast of Washington and British Columbia, and they're endangered. They only eat Chinook salmon, so it doesn't matter what's in the water with them, if it's a hot dog or whatever, they're not going to touch it. They're just going to eat Chinook salmon, which is a little bit tricky if that food is, you know, not, it's either not healthy or it's not in high enough numbers. Um, and, and it's a big source of ecotourism. Millions of people will go on these islands and take these whale watch boats uh, to, to see them, which is great, but uh, it does raise a couple issues. This is uh, where I was working. It's called Friday Harbor. It's a really beautiful island off the coast of Washington. Small, but beautiful. The last time I was there, we got to see a different group of killer whales, but if the video plays, I'll show you one of my favorite behavioral things that they do. So you'll see a really big male dorsal fin, and then you'll see a killer whale spy hop, which basically means the killer whale puts its head out of the water just to look around and see what's up, and then puts its head back underneath the water, and I find it very adorable. So let's see if this works. So here we go. In a second, we'll see maybe like a small female. We'll see a big male dorsal fin right about now. And then here comes the spy hop. Ready? Boop. Look at that. Just looking around. I love it. One of my favorite behaviors because it's just like us. Like I'm stuck inside because of COVID. So I'll look outside if I, if I hear something. And basically the killer whale is doing the same thing. Now, at one time, there can be upwards of 80 or 90 boats that are trying to watch these killer whales. But that's problematic because the killer whales hunt and communicate using sound and, and much like bats do. So basically, having all these boats on scene causes them to shout, and that can use a lot of resources. It can stress them out. So basically, I was, yeah, I, brought, I was brought onto this team, and they said, Charlie, will you study these animals? And I said, yeah, stupid question. And then they said, but you can't get within 200 yards. And I didn't know how that was possible. If, you know, 200 yards, it's two football fields. Like, you see a little dorsal fin in the, in the background. What, how am I supposed to pet him like that? Uh, but you have to get really creative when it comes to solving issues like that, and that's where Tucker came in. Tucker was trained on land to smell their poop. Their poop has a lot of interesting information, hormones, what they're eating, their DNA. And eventually he was taken onto a boat 
And that's where uh, he was, you know, put into action. And, and he sniffed out so many incredible samples. We learned so much about them. He actually recently passed away after he retired. Uh, he was a legend and uh, forever changed the health of these animals, which was really eye-opening for me to see. That. All right, well, here's Tucker at work. And he's got different poses. So when he's kind of just looking around, that's on the far right. Again, upper left, he's kind of just chilling. And his body language completely changes when he smells something interesting. And that's bottom left there. He gets pretty much parallel to the water. It's frustrating sometimes because he would do that when there was just like a butterfly. And we'd all freak out thinking there was a really cool sample, but it was, it was butterfly. Still, it's an incredible dynamic to have to read a dog's body language and then find something floating in the water as a result of it. And this is what it looks for. It looks just like this. This is, I'm sure you were all wondering what killer whale poop looks like. It's tough because top right, it looks like plant matter. And uh, some of the descriptions are gross. So a big one is a pancake, which is awesome. And then uh, there's one that's called egg drop soup. Ruin that, which is fine. I wasn't a big fan anyways, but different. They need to come up with different descriptions. Anyway, it, it smells like bad fish. It's not really that bad at all. My cat's poop is way worse than this. Eventually, as, as fecal analysis would, would increase and become more popular, scientists kept finding weird things in the samples. And these, this is an example of, of some samples I was sent from this guy here, an otter. And if you look, you can almost see stuff that looks like styrofoam. And otters are notoriously stupid, and, so, and they'll eat the bottom of docks, which are buoyant because of, of styrofoam. They're not stupid. They're cute, but I don't know why they do that. Um, but this kind of prompted us to look into these small plastics and see what other organisms might be eating plastic. Very scared. Um, I, I specifically, I wanted to look at microplastics. Now, anything bigger than five millimeters, we call it macroplastic. So that could be a bag, it could be a utensil, a straw. We kind of had an idea as to how those are bad, right? It can cause uh, like a blockage in the GI tract, an animal can feel full and not eat, a lot of choking hazards there. Um, but we were finding these small plastics, and, and that's really wanted, where I wanted to focus my research because there wasn't a lot of knowledge about how they interacted with animals, what they even were, how to identify what it is. Um, scientists have done a lot of research in the lab, but a lot of research was still lacking. So the first question is how they get so small. Uh, you, might, you might see a lot of trash like this on the beach. Now, I have to warn you, my graphic design skills are really amazing. So when I move forward here, I just hope that you're all sitting so that you don't fall over. But a lot of times plastics like this interact with these de degradative forces like sunlight. And uh, you know, if you're in the sun for a long time, you get a sunburn, the same thing can happen to plastic to a certain extent. There's also the physicality of the ocean beating over time. And, and the ocean, if you've ever opened your eyes in it, is unpleasant because it's salty. So all three of those can take these really large, you know, pretty resistant plastics and, and make them into very small microplastics, which is what happens over time. There's also um, plastics that were created to be small, which I'll talk about in a second. So primary microplastics, you probably heard about the facial beads. So there was exfoliants that were put into a lot of these cleaning solutions and uh, it would scrape away the dead skin on your face, but they were putting plastic beads in, in the stuff. And basically it's a direct line into the environment because it goes into your sink, passes through wastewater treatment, and, and into the environment beyond. Secondary microplastics are the result of weathering, kind of like what we said from the sun or the ocean. And what ends up happening is that they enter the food chain, whether it's on land or in the ocean. And small animals take them up accidentally. Sometimes in the ocean, microplastics can smell like food, and then they make their way up the food chain. But there's still a lot of, a lot of questions because technically I could have a cup full of microplastics and drink it and poop it out, and maybe it wouldn't have anything, any negative interaction in my body. So there were still a lot of questions, even though we were able to identify where they came from, we still had a lot of questions as to their presence in an animal in the environment. Now, microplastics and plastics in general don't like water. They do not like water. And a lot of contaminants, chemicals, dangerous things also don't like water. So they're attracted to each other. So heavy metals, antibiotics, and organic pollutants are all found in, in a variety of ecosystems and have been documented forming this bond with plastics. And they concentrate on the surface at really, really high levels. That's also in addition to what might be within the, the chemistry of the plastic themselves. So a lot of these plastics, they have these chemicals added to make them more flexible and, and they're actually endocrine disruptors or they're cancer causing. But those first three can concentrate up to a million times the level that's found in the surrounding water, which is really, really, really dangerous. And the more times a microplastic breaks, the higher the surface area is. So there's more opportunities for something to stick to the surface. 
surface. It's really dangerous stuff. Um, and, and basically, we know that plastic since the 1950s has been has skyrocketed in, in use and production. And so we would expect the same from microplastics, which is a really, you know, you piece these things together and it's pretty scary. This is a picture that was sent to me by a citizen scientist who had uh, sent us some beach samples. And you can just see that there's all sorts of colors that should not be in there. And it's, it's kind of tough to see, but if you can notice these small kind of white round pieces, those are what we call nurdles. Those are actually pre-production plastic. So if, if something, what's plastic around me? I don't know, this speaker. If, if this is made out of plastic, in order to make this mold, they have to take a bunch of these little pellets and melt them into this mold. And that's what those little white things are, which is scary because that just means that one of these industries or one of these facilities, they're spilling them and they're going into the sewer. So this is definitely increasing popularity, right? I mean, almost every other day, there's some article about plastic and microplastic and and rightly so, just because as many things that we know about it, there's equal parts that we don't know. And so what we've learned is these plastics end up in beach sand and they end up in soil around the world. In marine ecosystems, they can be taken in. So in that picture, actually, those are dyed plastics that were done in the lab to see if the shrimp would take them in. Sure enough, they are at very high numbers. You can see that the brightness outside the shrimp is very low and inside the shrimp is really high, very high concentration. So that shrimp is eaten by a small fish, that small fish is eaten by a killer whale, and then we're able to find it in the fecal samples. And one thing I like to show people with this is that killer whale is eating a Chinook salmon. And, and we kind of have this disconnect between us and nature where we say humans and nature, and then we don't really see us as one continuous unit. But here's a recipe for a Chinook salmon and pretty solid recipe, four and a half stars. But you know, if the salmon is being found with this nasty thing in its body, uh, you know, it's a good chance that we might be consuming the same stuff. So, um, you know, seafood has definitely been established as a route that we can take these plastics in. They've actually done research on uh, oysters that were destined to be eaten, and they went through them and found plastics in the stomach. And these animals are a little bit more dangerous to us because you're eating the whole stomach, whereas with a, a salmon or a halibut, you're not eating the stomach. That being said, they might, uh, you might find that those tissues and organs are able to pull that nasty stuff off the surface of microplastics. So it's still, still something to think about. So I actually use this method, I use this cool machine that utilizes a laser. The laser shines into something and, they, and it gives a, a signal back to my machine. And that signal is like a fingerprint. And so I'm able to look at something really, really, really small and not only tell if it's plastic, but be able to say what type of plastic it is. So this is kind of like a worldwide distribution of beach sand samples and soil samples that we've been sent. And those little squiggly lines with the peak, that's that fingerprint that I was talking about. So I'm able to say, you know, in, in Australia, we had polypropylene in Seychelles, we had PVC. It's a really cool method and, and we're still using it to this day. Hey everybody, we're back. Sorry about the technical difficulties, um, but it's all part of doing this online now, but thank you for sticking with us and we'll get right back into the presentation. Yeah, so sorry about that. Technology is it's amazing these days, but it's not immune to having its, its issues. So yeah, what I was saying is we like to study plastic from the beginning to the end. So on the far left, those were those little nurdles that I was talking about. Those are pre-production plastics. Want to understand how, how their chemistry changes in the environment. Then it, as it's made into a, something like a plastic water bottle, well, we want to understand that the impact that those water bottles might have or soda bottles might have. And then eventually there's the far right. That's the plastic that we've taken from the environment. I believe those microplastics came from the Arctic. So it's, again, it's no, no ecosystem in the ocean is immune from, from these things. One really interesting area that we ended up traveling to, so the, the lab that I, I currently work in studies wastewater, and it's a really incredible thing to study because you can look at entire communities. You can look at stuff like what they're eating, if, what they're do, using drugs, uh, consuming alcohol. You can look at all of that, and it's anonymous. You can't tie it to anyone. So my lab is a really great strength with, with studying wastewater treatment plants. And one day, my advisor, he, he put his hands behind his head, and he leaned back, and whenever that happens, it's either going to be something brilliant or something really weird. Uh, this was kind of a combination of both. He said, I wonder what happens to contact lenses because they're flimsy. And when you take them out of your eye, you can't see. And then you lose them. And then they dry out and they break. I just think he was in a bad mood from some experience he had because I wear glasses. I wouldn't know. Regardless, it was a question that was worth asking because it's kind of an unusual type of plastic, right? It's, it's a type of plastic that we actually need and that we need to function with. And a lot of people in their daily lives, if they don't have their contacts in, it's going to be a problem and they're not going to be able to see. So it's uh, unlike a plastic water bottle, contact lenses and medical plastics are very personal to us. So we ended up finding a bunch of expired contact lenses at a local optometrist. 
And uh, sure enough, we did a experiment in a waste water treatment plant. The first step of this was to see if there's even an issue. So we created a survey and about 416 people responded who wear contact lenses. And one of the questions was, how do you dispose of your contact lenses? And the answers were in the trash, you know, flush it down the drain or I lose them, whatever. We found that about 20 pe- 20%, so one in five people, they flush their lenses down the sink or the toilet, which was a surprise to me. I thought it would maybe be 5%. 20% is pretty significant. So the next question became, what's the behavior of these contact lenses in a wastewater treatment plant? Because there's several parts of this treatment process that are designed to break down biological matter. I'll say it nicely. Um, and, and so what we did is we took 11 different types of contact lenses and put them in two tanks that are responsible for breaking stuff down. There's a ton of microbial activity. So if there's going to be some sort of breakdown, it's going to happen in these two tanks. One is, uh, is a tank where they're starved of oxygen. That's in panel A. You can see the, the ropes are laying straight. And panel B, that's where they're given a bunch of oxygen. They just go crazy on all the biological material in there. So uh, we put contact lenses in both of those. And then in C, and this is, this is the, the end product, so biosolids. After you treat all this stuff coming from your community, it's actually really, really beneficial fertilizer that's then taken out and, and sent to a landfill. It's a land applied or like an agricultural field, or it's burned. We decided to go through it for about, I don't know, 45 minutes. And sure enough, we found two contact lens fragments that we later identified in panel D. And uh, what we learned from panels A and B is that the contact lenses didn't change. They were in really good shape still. They weren't breaking down. They were still physically intact. And, uh, and that told us that this whole process is not removing them from the waste stream and that they're actually continue on and going into the environment. It's scary because there's a lot of nasty things in wastewater treatment plants, a lot of nasty chemicals and, and contaminants and all sorts of, of pathogens. So this was a really interesting study. Uh, the people that work here, they sell the fertilizer. So they say it smells like money. It does not smell like money, especially in Arizona when it's hot. It does not smell like money. Going from killer whale poop to this was, was a rough, rough day. Anyways, we submitted it to a conference, and for whatever reason, it blew up. And people all over the world were interested in this, and all these, all these media groups focused on our work. It reached almost 2 billion people worldwide. One of my collaborators, his name is Varun Kalkar. He's from India. And his aunt actually read about our study in their native language before he could tell her about it, which was one of the coolest things that happened as a result of this. Um, but, you know, we were surprised. We were happy to get the attention. It's good to, to, to feature plastic pollution. The really cool thing, too, is that Bausch and Loam actually cited our work in, in creating this contact lens recycling collaboration. The UK actually did the same thing, cited our work. Um, and, and people left and right would come up to us and say, I had no idea this was a thing. I stopped flushing my lenses. Uh, I think that there's just a general lack of knowledge of what happens when you flush anything away from your house. So it was, it was really cool that we could actually see behavioral changes as a ro- result of linking interesting science with media coverage. It created this behavioral change, which was really, really neat for us to see. So we were super pumped about that. Now, contact lens recycling. We'll talk about recycling in a second. It's a little bit of a weird word to use. We also did another cool study with an, a remotely operated vehicle, that machine on the left, in collaboration with a group out of Monterey Bay, California, where they actually lowered it about 1,000 meters below the ocean, 3,000 feet, and they would sample at different depths just to see what was in the water. And they sent me the filters. I went through the filters, and I found fibers, plastic fibers, all the way down 3,000 feet below the ocean, which I never would have thought. I would have thought they'd all float. Uh, so the next step of that research was to look at really important animals in that, in that area. So we looked at a larvation species that lived around 600 feet below the ocean. And then we looked at a really, really popular uh, species of crab, which is one of the highest prey sources of any animal in the world for, for the surrounding ecosystem. And sure enough, we found those same plastic fibers in the stomachs of the crab and the larva. So it's, it's moving into the food chain and up the food chain. We also looked at a really interesting bird, which I'll talk about shortly. Here's an example of what it looks like. So this is a, a bright blue fiber that was extracted from the stomach of a crab. Now, this could come from a variety of sources. We know that wind is able to move fibers around the world, finding them on Mount Everest. We know that there, it's probably you know, leaving our houses and our wash because we're wearing a lot of polyester. And when you wash your clothes, think about all that lint that's in the dryer that goes right into the wastewater and follows the same path. And we also know that fishing nets are made out of plastic. So it's a good chance that this could be from a fishing net that's breaking down over time. Uh, either way, it's, it was a surprise, and it's something we didn't want to find. Um, and it's that same concept, right? You wash something that's synthetic, 
it goes through wastewater treatment into the ocean. It's taken in by these, by these animals that I mentioned, and, and we find it in their feces. Now, that bird at the very bottom, that's called a red-footed booby, which is a funny name for a bird because um, you say you study boobies, but it's in the natural world, no one really you know, takes you seriously anyways. But these birds lived on an island called the Palmyra Atoll. It's a six-day boat ride from Hawaii. No one is allowed on the island unless you're a nature conservancy worker. There's very little contact with humans. This bird I got fecal samples from went through it and found the same types of fibers, which is crazy because they're nowhere near people. Also, birds that, that, that feed on the surface of the water, if there's plastics floating, they can accidentally take them in. That's not these birds. If you watch those awesome David Attenborough documentaries where birds dive into the ocean to grab a fish, that's these birds. So, so they're, they're definitely getting these, these fibers from the fish that they're, that they're consuming, which is scary stuff. So as we continue on in the research world, we've, we've noticed more and more studies about pathways of plastics to reach us. We talked about oysters earlier and seafood. Now we know that our clothing can shed and end up in the air. Anytime you see sun coming in your house and all that stuff floating, that can definitely contain plastic. There's been items like beer and honey, table salt, bottled, bottled water, tap water. All of these have been shown to have microplastics, which begs the question, what is going on in our bodies in, you know, in relation to this stuff? So we started a study to try to figure that out. We looked at organs that are specifically going to be filtering things out. So your kidney, your liver, and then your lungs in terms of breathing stuff. We think that if there's small enough particles, they can end up being sequestered in these. There has been prior research shown that rats that are fed small plastics, as well as uh, oysters, clams, mussels, some of them are, are pooped out, but then some of them end up in the organs and the tissue. And, and so what we did is we used two different types of analytical processes to dig down and really try to find these small, small particles. And so far, the method where we're working on it, it's a work in progress, especially now with COVID, it's difficult to do research. Uh, our lab is actually analyzing COVID in wastewater, so we have to be really careful when we go in to do this work. But um, we, we submitted this for a conference. Again, it's getting great coverage because we, we want to make the connection to people. At this point, if you report finding microplastics somewhere, it's like, eh, yeah, that's plastic. It gets everywhere. That's, it's assumed. So we really have to, to make that connection between people and the environment and plastic pollution. And that's what we're aiming to do with this study. So the questions that's always asked to me is, is how do I help? Where do we go from here? Um, well, there's a couple answers to that. First is recycling. We created this to kind of give people an idea as to how this process works. But in, in Arizona, in the summer, it's quite hot. And over the course of a day, if I were to drink four water bottles and put all four in the recycling bin, three of them will go to a landfill, straight to a landfill. The one that ends up going to a recycling center will be turned into something like the fibers of a coat. So there's that, that same system we're talking about with fiber pollution. And, and the reason for that is that First of all, these, these recycling centers are completely overburdened. We're using way too much recycled, you know, it's way too much plastic. It's, it's not a, it's a great process in the sense the more you recycle something, the more you wear it out. And it's not as structurally sound as using a new plastic. It's also less expensive to use a new plastic. So all of these kind of make the process really difficult. And, and most of the time, if something is turned into something else, like contact lenses, they're what we call downcycled. They're turned into something of lesser value. So contact lenses will become a park bench or a playground equipment. Out of the waste stream, not necessarily recycling as we think about it. It's not bottle to bottle. Um, so this is one of the misconceptions, right? As soon as we put something in recycling, we feel like Smokey the Bear. We're, we're great on the environment. It's not the case. So this is something we definitely need to be more aware of. It, it's directly tied to our usage. If we use less, I think these centers could really catch up. We also need to understand that there's plastics that we do need. You know, medical plastics are a great example of that. And there's plastics that we don't need. And I put those spoons in there because that's a really simple fix to what's going on right now. If, if, if you're getting DoorDash or, or Uber Eats or whatever, you, you have that option to say, there's a little box, right? You can say, I don't need silverware. And it seems like a small thing, but if everyone collectively did that in the United States, it would be a massive reduction in plastic, which we can then incentivize to the business as saying, you'll save money because you don't have to give so much of this stuff up. Um, plastics, we, some plastics we need, some plastics we don't. And, and a lot of this comes from our perception, right? We see these pictures in the news. 
we see a bird that died because of eating plastic. We see 30 bags that were pulled out of the stomach of a dead whale. We see animals entangled in plastic. We see a plastic straw pulled out of a sea turtle's nose. And, and all of these in us will instill negative reactions. No one's going to be happy because of this. But we know where these are coming from. They're coming from all of these things. And, and a lot of these plastic items we have positive reactions to. So that someone will see that Starbucks cup on the beach and say, that looks good. You know, I want to be right there. So it's, it's, we need to keep that negative connection in mind and realize that the stuff we're finding in the environment is the stuff that we're using every day. And, and with so many of these, there's really easy alternatives to not using them, right? There's so many options for us to avoid a lot of these single-use plastics. And single-use plastics right now are pretty much the bane of all of our existence because if you just use something once, that lasts in the environment for thousands of years. And I don't BS. When I, when I say I find these things, this is, a, this is a bag of sand that I was sent from San Francisco, and that's a you know, plastic utensil right there, front and center, amongst other nasty stuff. So it's, it really does end up in the environment. It's something that we need to be better at you know, in terms of our usage. Uh, and lastly, this, this is what kind of hurts my head. This is crazy to me. So you know, back in the day, we start mass producing these cars. And these cars are, you know, they run. The, they're incredibly unsafe. The emissions are okay. They don't get great gas mileage. And if you get into a car accident, the car will be great. You'll be so dead that it's not even funny. Like the glass can shatter and impale you. The car is just not safe. So fast forward to now, we literally have electric cars, right? That's crazy. And if they're not electric, they have much better emissions. They get better gas mileage and they're much safer. So then you go back in time to the 1950s when we start making plastics. These things are meant to last a really long time, and they're supposed to be cheap. And then if they're really rigid, then you have to add this chemical to make them flexible. And the chemical is an endocrine disruptor, as we said, and it can cause cancer. In, in, our, in our TED Talk, my advisor said uh, it gives men breasts and women breast cancer, which is, which is true, these chemicals. So then, okay, let's fast forward to the you know, driving in our Tesla. And it's the same thing. It's the same plastic. Like it, Nothing has really changed. We're, we're making new ones. We're, we're coming up with these bioplastics that are a little scary as well, but it's a lot, it's the same stuff. And we don't see that evolution. You know, you hear PVC piping, VC is vinyl chloride. It's really dangerous for people and it's not changed. So this is crazy to me. And, and I don't know what's, what it's going to take to create that change, but that's part of the reason why we do the research that we do. And, and a lot of the, the power is in your hands. If, if there's an item at the store, like orange juice that comes in a plastic bottle or a carton, Go for the carton. If collectively, if we all go for the carton, it's going to cause a really big shift in, in what they're going to be carrying. And, and your voice, your voice matters and it carries a lot of weight. If I go to the grocery store and there's a cucumber wrapped in plastic, I'll use social media and I'll kind of politely say, you know, these cucumbers actually come with their own skin. So it's all good. You don't need to put plastic on it. And a lot of times they'll listen and they'll carry, you know, the things that we want. So, so definitely use your power politely. If you go to a restaurant when things get better and they give you a straw, you know, I'll, I always just ask, like, is it possible for you to just give a straw when someone asks for one instead of just assuming? Lots of little things may not seem like it makes a big difference, but collectively, if we all do it, it's a big deal. If my friend gives me a quarter, it's only a quarter. If 100 people give me a quarter, it's a lot more money. So that is the end of my, my talk, and it's getting darker here in Arizona, so I'm trying to open the shades a little bit. Uh, but if anyone has any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them and uh, continue the dialogue. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Charlie. Um, it's so crazy to think about how, you know, something that I use every day or like everybody uses in their day to day ends up in the ocean and in people's bodies. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get into some questions. Um, you know, we host a lot of beach cleanups with ideas for us. And it's almost like a fun but terrible game to play where I pick up a piece of plastic and like, oh, I wonder what part of the world this is from. Um, I wonder like what car part this used to be. Um, so it just was crazy how everything can end up there. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, so my first question is something I'm really curious about. What's your opinion on compostable or biodegradable plastic? It's a great question. So we, Part of what I did is specifically at Plastic Oceans is try to define these terms and define them as accurately as possible. So if something is compostable, right? If something is biodegradable, that suggests that if, like I have this succulent right here, right? If this succulent dies, which it looks like it's going to, and it ends up in the soil, 
hundred percent of that succulent is available for microbial breakdown is, is available to the ecosystem, right? As nutrients, something can break down a hundred percent of that. It's just like a banana peel. That's, that's available to the ecosystem. If we're making these products that are supposed to copy plastic, but they're not a hundred percent available to the ecosystem, it's not really biodegradable. And, and what we're seeing is a lot of these bioplastics mimic plastic too well to the point that they will last just as long as the environment as, as, a, as a normal plastic. So something like uh, polylactic acid. So PLA was on these, uh, these new kind of plastic containers and they had them at restaurants and it would show like a little leaf on it and it would say degradable in the environment. There should be an asterisk next to it that says under certain conditions where it has to be really hot or really moist over a long period of time so that the asterisk pretty much negates it breaking down in the environment. So when people use these terms, we have to hold them accountable and make sure to what extent is it biodegradable, under what circumstances is it biodegradable, and are we mimicking plastics so closely that it basically just becomes a new type of plastic. Okay, so it's best to, of course, avoid plastic altogether. It's a better option, but um, you know, not the perfect option. We're getting um, there, right? With a lot of this stuff, you can't just go cold turkey. It's going to mm -hmm. be in the right direction, right? And, you know, you might be, uh, something might be 50% less plastic and then 75% less plastic, and that's fine. We just need to be really careful about using these words and making sure we're actually, uh, you know, it, it applies to the definition and is it just like kind of biodegradable. Yeah, but, you know, this plastic exists because we created a demand for it. And so that's also a good thing to keep in mind, like you were saying, uh, we make the decisions. Um, yep. So we have a question from the Facebook comments. If we toss plastic in our trash bags in our kitchens and our homes, um, do you think it's going to end up in the ocean anyway? There, so you have to look at likelihood. If I, if I wash my clothing, if I wear 100% polyester and I wash my clothing, there's a high chance that some fibers are going to end up going into the water and then into the environment just because I'm providing that really quick access. It's small. It's a water. It's going to the environment. It's not being treated. So there's a high probability that that will end up in the environment. If I put plastic in the garbage can, it goes to a landfill more than likely. And what are the, the chances of it going from the landfill to the environment? There's still a chance, but it's a much lower risk ending up in the environment than if I were to just, than, than something like washing my clothes. So it's not perfect, but, but the, the, the opportunities for it to, to enter the environment are far less than if we were to just you know, throw it out into the, into the ocean. Great, great answer. Um, so I have a question about our ocean cleaning up process. Um, it's a big job, but you know, there's a lot of initiatives out there. And I was wondering if you knew of maybe the best or most effective route or stopping it at the faucet is really the only way to go. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, the gyres in the Great Pacific garbage patch and the other garbage patches as well. Um, there's work being done to clean those up. So I'd love to hear what you think is the most effective route to, you know, reversing the problem. A great question. Very complicated, right? Because plastic, we're so saturated and we use it so often that it's, it's difficult. Um, it does start at the tap. Honestly, it does. We, we're just using way too much. If we stopped using so much, especially if we just stopped using single use plastic, that would be a huge burden that would be lifted off the environment and off recycling centers and everything else. So it does start there. First and foremost, we have to we have to make that change as consumers. Next, we need to hold a lot of these businesses accountable. And, and if they're producing a lot of items that are made out of plastic, we need to say to them that this is not okay and that we can't keep compromising the health of our environment and, and our health as, as well. Um, but in terms of, yeah, beach cleanups are wonderful. If you're able to go out there and collect stuff, it's, it's, a, it's great, right? It's, it matters for that ecosystem and it, it's a great tool to empower people to make a difference. What I think we have to do is we have to incentivize it a little bit better. We need to figure out more products and more opportunities for plastic to be recycled into something that maybe removes it for the, from the, the environment for good. And, you know, it's just like a Coke can. A Coke can has that five cent thing on it saying if you recycle it in some states, you can get five cents back. If we could, you know, incentivize it like that, then there would be more of a demand for people to use recycled plastics. But it's just, it's so difficult because, you know, you just make it into something else. So is that fixing it? You know, it's if it's just becoming another item, um, it's it's a tough one. And then of course, like I said, recycled plastic doesn't hold its integrity like new plastic. And the the way to clean it and the way to turn it into something is more expensive than buying new plastic. So we're just we are very much stuck 
but you know, I, I still am optimistic. Every little thing that we can do is helpful. And, uh, and you know, it does, we have a lot of power as consumers. And, and I think if the more we realize that, the more we can make these really positive changes. Yeah, absolutely. It really does come down to us. And, you know, it's easy to blame corporations like Coca-Cola, but at the end of the day, if you're buying Coke, the middleman is there. Um, so another question is, what are your thoughts on styrofoam? Is it just as bad? Is it worse? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, it's it's not great, right? It's plastic. It's that's a long time. It's a little bit, it's, it's not able to withstand a lot of the degradation that, that the, maybe the more sturdy plastics can withstand. And, and it absolutely ends up in the environment, it ends up in animals. And it's, it's, it's one of the, the bad ones, right? Right with the other ones. And, and now I think we have an opportunity more than ever to, to use other materials to pack stuff. There's even a group out here called Footprint that recycle or it uses a uh, paper in, in place of plastic. So it heats it, it turns it into a slurry, it heats it, it forms a mold. And it's able to to pretty much do what styrofoam does and protect things that we're mailing and so on and so forth uh, without using plastic. So it's it is just as bad and almost worse in the sense that it's going to break down a lot quicker than than something else, but not to a state where it'll disappear. It'll just be there in a smaller form. Hmm. Yeah, because it's also harder to recycle. From from my understanding, in a lot of places do most plastic, but they don't do styrofoam. Right. Um, correct. So. And in terms of microplastics, I know you kind of focused on the the problems with that and how it ends up like in every part of our lives. Um, I was wondering if there was any area of the impact that it makes that is more dangerous than others. Um, for example, you know, ending up in our fish that we are eating or messing up the food cycle that exists. Um, if there's any particular ways that it is most dangerous. Yeah, it's a good question. You, we have to kind of think about it as risk. And the risk will get worse and it'll go up when it's a type of plastic that's known to absorb nasty things or it's a type of plastic that has nasty things in the chemistry. That's, that's the first one. The, the other risk is size. We know that if it's big enough, it's not going to be sequestered in tissues or organs. Uh, and if it's small enough, it can absolutely make its way into you know, the, the organs or tissues of, of an animal or a fish. And, and it, when that, something like that happens, when there's a foreign body that's entering our tissues and organs, it oftentimes will cause inflammation. And inflammation is, is a known precursor to cancer. So, so those two categories of risk, I think, if you, if you decrease the size, and then if you make it a type of plastic that's known to have these you know, worse interactions than other types of plastics, that's what makes it, it worse as a microplastic. And, and that, in that size category, we're going into more of the nano, nanoplastic scale, but still very small and still able to cause a lot of harm. And kind of bouncing off that question, I know everybody talks about sea turtles and they're kind of a mascot for plastic pollution, which is good because it kind of gets people's attention and to care about it more. Um, but is there any species that you have found is the most affected by it? Maybe like birds because they often eat the plastic because it's shiny sometimes or, or what have you seen in your research um, that is the most impacted by the plastic pollution? That's a really good question. It's difficult. You know, it's difficult to study the ocean on a good day. And, and so trying to figure that out, that's, it's a great basis for, for a study. Uh, we, we know that, that there's definite mortality when it comes to macroplastics. Anything that's big, we've seen mortality. And, and that's been pretty much widespread across the, the globe, whether it's bags or straws or what have you. Uh, that's, that's totally been identified. With the smaller ones, it's more difficult to prove. But there are studies that have shown that uh, microplastics can cause population declines. An, an entire population decline of, of small organisms. So uh, again, you have to kind of look at the, the ecosystem. Well, how does the animal feed? Uh, is there a heavy human population nearby? Are there opportunities for plastics to enter the, the water really easily in that area? All of these together, you know, if you, if you combine those and you look at a given ecosystem, you can kind of rank which animal is going to be most impacted. Um, but certainly it affects really large animals and it affects really small animals. To the extent that it affects them, we still have yet to, to really know, you know, besides doing a necropsy on a whale that's died or doing a, a lab study. It's difficult just because it's the ocean and it's hard to study. Yeah, for sure. Um, but, you know, getting people's attention is easy when you say we found it in humans. Um, yeah. So do you know of any, um, there's like been talk about these microbes that eat plastics and styrofoam. What are your thoughts on that as a solution? 
I'm not going to turn my nose up to anything just because at this point we're so desperate for change that, you know, I'll give anything the time of day just because we need it. It's, it's an interesting concept. It's, it's been proven in lab, you know, laboratory experiments with items like styrofoam. My fear with it is you can't just take a microorganisms and, and throw it into the water and say, go eat the plastic and not expect there to be some cascade of events that happen as a result of it. Anytime you introduce a new species, it's really dangerous. So while I see the practical application to a certain extent, I don't know how it's going to be useful outside of a lab. You know, it's just, it's not great to introduce a new species at the end of the day. So it, it, but maybe that's a stepping stone and maybe three or four versions of that later, we have something that can be more useful. So I'm, I'm happy to, to entertain it and hear about it, um, but it's not, not going to help us immediately necessarily. Interesting. Yeah, but it's always good to find new ideas, new solutions, um, because like you said, we're, we're pretty desperate. Yeah. Um, so to kind of close out our time, I'd love to hear some in information about how can we as a society move away from plastic? Um, you know, there's individual action, but also maybe like legislation or local action. Just what is your call to action for our audience to start implementing these solutions into their own lives? Absolutely. So yeah, it does. Again, it starts with our perception. We need it when we go shopping, when we see this stuff, we need to remember what's in it. We need to remember where it ends up. And if we, we start by changing our behavior, then that's going to be a big shift. And, and this is an issue that is so big that we have to start at the ground level and work our way all the way to the top. So as community members, again, we have a lot of power. We can start by reducing the plastic that we're purchasing from stores. We can start by promoting companies that are either sending money and helping with this issue or they're themselves using less plastic. And if we start, just those two by themselves, if we just did that as a country, it'd be a big shift. It'd be a lot less plastic in the environment. But then we need to look around. We need to look around at our local communities and see how is our recycling? Is it efficient here? Is it underfunded? Uh, what's the legislature looking like? Are, you know, do we have a plastic bag ban? Or are we, do we have incentives for people not to use single use plastics? And if you don't have that, then, then reach out to, to the people that you vote for, that you elect, and, and hold them accountable and say that, you know, although right now it's difficult to avoid plastic because of the pandemic, we need to double down on our, our action once, once things get better. And then from there, hold these businesses accountable. Go, you know, if you're able to have those conversations with people where you can say, hey, is it okay if you just bring water uh, and, and ask people if they need a straw, and then you save money and, and promote the restaurants that are being more sustainable and then higher than that, the companies that are making the stuff, you know, it's, we have so much power as consumers and as community members, uh, you know, our vote carries a lot of weight, our, our wallet carries a lot of weight. So if we can combine all of these and help support the beach cleanups, help support the sustainable products, then, then that's a massive shift in the right direction. And I think we're getting there. I think we're really close. Um, you know, we just have to hit pause until things get better, hopefully next year. And we can really double down on, especially our single use plastics that, that's the biggest issue when it comes to plastic pollution and the completely the easiest one to avoid with, with stuff like this, with, you know, with reusable straws, silverware, all that good stuff. Again, if we all collectively did that, it would be a huge load off of the environment, huge burden that would be avoided. Awesome. Well, you heard it here today, folks. Uh, it's time to steer away from plastic. Thank you so much, Charlie, for your time and for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge. I know that you've made a great impact on my life, inspired me to take more action, and I'm sure our audience as well. So thank you so much for your time and for being here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank you for all you guys do. This is a, it's an incredible thing to see as scientists because it's hard for us to really reach certain communities of people, but what you guys do in the outreach is, I mean, there's nothing to replace it. So congrats on all the, the great work. Thank you. Yeah, it's important that we all do our part um, doing the research and doing the action. Um, we'd love to share your articles with our audience so that we can give them further information and give a deeper dive into your research. But thank you so much again for being here. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about our upcoming programming and kind of close us out today. Um, and we'll share more about different ways to be sustainable on our social media um, upcoming in this next week. Um, so this Saturday, we do have a do-it-yourself sustainable gift workshop where you can come and make eco-friendly gifts um, for the holiday season for your friends and family or for yourself. Um, it's a free event, but we would love some support. Um, we got all of this as donations, so um, we would love to get some support from the community, but you can come for free, bring your friends, bring your family. Um, 
We're going to be making sustainable room sprays, plant assortments, homemade candles, bath salt creation, loose tea mixtures, but make sure to um, sign up because we're only allowing a limited number of people um, for COVID restrictions and having only a couple people at a table at a time. Of course, wear a mask. We're going to try and be very safe. It's going to be all outside, um, but we really want to make this season sustainable and help you guys do the same. Um, so please sign up for that on Eventbrite. You can find that on our Facebook. Um, and then same day, earlier in the day, um, we have a greenhouse clearance sale. So come out and get some plants, get some great gifts. Um, these make a great holiday Christmas present under the Christmas tree. You can put a little basil there um, and it smells nice. And, you know, it's just a really good idea for giving to yourself and to your family. Our next hive, which is going to be next year, is going to be talking about a water crisis, um, not you know, in another country, but in our community here in Orlando, we're going to be talking about the governmental aspects. We're going to be talking about um, the solutions and moving forward and where our water comes from. So this is going to be a deep dive in this panel. Um, I'm super excited to have this conversation to so make sure to be there and ask your questions and we can get a better understanding of where we're at with our water supply. Um, and like I said earlier, we do have internships coming up in spring 2021. We'd love to have you on our team. There's so many different opportunities. You can be on our international affairs team. You can be a fleet farming intern. There's so many ways to grow um, and help us do this impact. So please consider um, volunteering or being an intern. You can find that on our website um, under internships. And let's build the next environmental action today. Thank you all so much for being here. There's so much more to do and I'm excited for 2021 and all of the impact that we're gonna be able to make with your help. So if you have any ideas or you wanna get involved, you can reach out to these phone numbers or these emails and make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook so you can stay updated on all of our environmental action. Uh, but thank you all so much for being here today and I hope you have a wonderful holiday season.